he has agreed to join us uh, today um, virtually. Uh, Kingsley is founder and CEO of the Networking Institute that is based in Dublin, and he's a recognized um, expert in on networking. Um, he's done presentations to companies all over the world, including Google, LinkedIn, Advent, Accenture, Deloitte, and he's actually been to Queen's. He was at an event um, about three years ago that we did, and uh, was uh, a remarkable keynote speaker. So straight after that, I said to Gavin, we need to get Kingsley to come and speak to the AHEX conference because he, he really um, adds something um, to that. So a graduate of, of Trinity College Dublin and has worked in six countries um, where he found networking and building networks ex essential for what he's doing. So uh, today's session, why networking will be so crucial in a post-COVID world of disruption and opportunity. So without further ado, I want to uh, give a great virtual AHEX welcome to Kingsley Aiken. Kingsley, over to you. We will move to Q&A um, after, uh, towards the end of this keynote. So just say to delegates, if you want to, just on the right there, you see the Q&A, uh, put your questions in and we will put, I'll come back on and put some questions to Kingsley. But the floor is yours, Kingsley. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Trevor. I hope you can all hear me okay. And um, delighted to be uh, with you again, and uh, lovely to speak to this audience. Um, your introduction was uh, a little over the top, Trevor, I thought, a bit kind of over-egged, but I have to admit it was exactly the same as the one I emailed you last week, so thank you very much for that. And uh, Trevor, you're right. I um, We were involved before. You have a good memory. Um, Trevor invited me uh, to speak up in Queens. Um, uh, some years ago, as he said, somebody said to me the other day, Trevor Johnson always invites you to speak twice, first when your career is on the way up, and secondly, when your career <laughs> is on the way down. So Trevor, great to be back, and, and thank you very much for the introduction. And um, so today, you know, it's going to all be about networking. I have this little company called the Networking Institute, so obviously that's my kind of interest and passion. And here's what's interesting, given COVID is that the hidden cost of COVID, which hasn't been talked very much about, is network shrinkage. And that's what's happened under COVID. There's a very interesting book I read last week by Marissa King. It's called Social Chemistry. She's a professor in Yale. And she said a few kind of startling things about network and COVID. She said, under COVID, men's networks have decreased by 30% and women's networks haven't decreased at all, which is kind of a fascinating piece of information statistically. Now, I know it's out of North America, um, but I'd be interested to know, you know what the reaction and response is here. And, and she explained it like this. She said, research shows that men are quite transactional. They quite like to do stuff together. They like to go for a pint, uh, go to a match, play golf, go fishing, whatever it is, whereas women are slightly different. Um, they're much more into keeping the emotional connection together, much more interested in having conversations and talking together. So I thought that was kind of fascinating because you see, normally networks don't shrink. They kind of, they kind of churn. And you know, new people in your network tend to be constantly replaced by, by uh, replace old ones. And that's kind of the churn that goes on in your network. But under COVID, what we're finding is that, you know, old relationships are not being replaced by new relationships. In fact, we've shifted both time and attention to spending more time and attention with a much smaller group of people, maybe as small as five or 10 people in terms of family and then some close friends. And you know, your network is kind of like concentric rings. And so we're now focusing on this narrow, very close ring and that the, the wider concentric ring, which is out there, which is this ring of kind of acquaintances and weak connections, and that's reduced kind of dramatically. And there are sort of serious downsides to all of this, particularly in terms of the world that you all inhabit about finding a job and building and developing a career and getting promoted. There's less randomness happening. There's less kind of chance and serendipity happening. The meeting outside the meeting isn't happening. And um, there's less business development going on because um, People are connect, tending to connect well uh, with their existing customers and clients, but not developing new customers and clients. Um, there's possibly a decreased sort of sense of belonging, um, a higher risk of turnover. You know, before COVID came, the big crisis for companies was the attraction and retention of talent. What's going to happen that now? 
Um, and then there's quite simply, and I was talking to my nephew this morning who has spent six months, you know, basically in, in, a, in a house doing research for his PhD. There's, a, there's this absence of boy meeting girl stuff going on, which, you know, 30% of people in the United States, for example, meet their partner in life through work. So, so we're paying a bit of a price for this, and this kind of networking shrinkage is interesting. So we will talk today about what individuals can do about building their network and why, but also um, companies need to think about in terms of creating a greater networking culture. Organizations like universities and colleges need to think about how do you create this networking culture? You know, you've got to hire people who are good at it. You've got to make it a KPI. You've got to reward and recognize people uh, for, 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 for being good at networking. You have to, you know, believe in network intelligence. The way to finding out what's going on in your sector, in your world, in your city, in your segment is through your network. There's an old cliche, I remember when I worked in the US that said, if Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard knows, it'd be a great company. In other words, there's enormous knowledge within people's networks, within organizations, and trying to get that out is, becomes a perennial kind of challenge. So companies now have to open up, I think, to the outside world, to invite people in, to try to attract diversity into the people who are spending time in the organizations, either as workers or even as visitors coming to events. They've got to develop their alumni. I mean, you all in universities know a lot about alumni development. And of course, the American university model is so extraordinary in that space. But now companies are beginning to do this. Companies are looking at their diaspora. And the company who's done it best in the world is McKinsey. And McKinsey, one in 30 people who join McKinsey make partner. The other 29 must leave. So McKinsey say, you're going, but we're going to keep in touch with you. And wherever, whatever you do in the rest of your career, we're going to tell everybody in our organization. So they now have 30,000 people in their McKinsey Global Alumni Network. It's run by a guy called Sean Brown out of Boston in Massachusetts. And it's an extraordinary network. And they keep in touch and they run events and they tell people what everybody else is doing. And guess what? McKinsey, ex-McKinsey employees refer business back to McKinsey. So there's a simple kind of motive in all of that. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about networking. I'm going to try and convince you, if, if you do need convincing, that um, <clears throat> the single most important element to be successful in, in business and may, very maybe in life also is to build a strong and diverse network. And there's an old Chinese proverb that says, you know, when is the best time to plant a tree? And the answer is 30, 20 years ago. Um, the second best time is now. So uh, if people haven't been doing this, then now is a good time to reflect on this. As, um, as Trevor mentioned, I mean, I've lived and worked in six countries around the world. And I arrived in some of these countries, I didn't know anybody. So I knew that to survive and thrive, I had to build a strong and diverse network. This was not a kind of nice to have, it was a must have. It wasn't a luxury, it was absolutely a necessity for developing my career. And frankly, I wasn't very good at it at the start. I really never put any time or attention into it. Um, certainly not something I did at school or college. I mean, just stuff kind of happened. But as I progressed through my career, I learned a few things about the importance of networking. I realized that we all have two types of network. We have an organic network, which is a function of our family, our school, the street we live in, or the area we live in, the sports we play, the people we go on holidays with, it just kind of happens. But as we progress through life, we actually have to become more strategic, more thoughtful, and more intentional about our network. And we have to get out of our head this notion of people are born networkers. You often hear that expression that he or she is a born networker. No, networking is something that is learned. Nobody's born good at this stuff. It's just something that you learn. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I learned along the way was to hang around with people who are good at networking. You know the way it is, we are the average of the people we hang around with. You know, hang around with pessimistic people, guess what you become. Hang around with optimistic people, guess what you become. So hang around with people who are good at networking. Some of this stuff kind of rubs off. Certainly something that I did throughout my life was to observe and learn. I a, found a member of an organization called CASE, which stands for Copy and Steal Everything. I found that just by hanging around people who are good at this stuff, some of this rubbed off. But maybe in a way, 
one of the challenges relates to schools and colleges because progress in those institutions depends on a mark, a score, a grade, a percentage, whatever it takes. That's the way it has to be and that's the way you progress and that's the way you get judged for moving to the next level and eventually um, for getting a job. But then when you get into a job, there's a whole series of things that really matter. Things like empathy and emotional intelligence, things like your attitude, your character, uh, your humor, your disposition, the element, the degree of trust that you engender, the, you know, your, your personality. All of these things matter. They all count, but they can't be counted. And that's one of the kind of challenges. In a sense, they are soft skills. And here's what's interesting. So many organizations now are saying soft skills are critically important. Hard skills you gotta have, but hard skills have a kind of a shorter and shorter shelf life. But soft skills, you're really gonna need those soft skills. Um, and you just see it with reports from the Deloitte's or the World Economic Forum or the McKinsey's are all saying that soft skills are gonna become more important in the future than hard skills. Some years ago, I. I spent, um, spent a day um, running courses for the National University of Singapore, NUS, which is the number one university in, uh, in Asia, number 20 in the world, an extraordinary institution. And they, they look around corners, they see problems coming, and they realize that the kids getting in there were the smartest, brightest kids in Asia, and they were deductive and analytical and really, really outstanding and completely crap when it came to the soft skills. And they've set up a center in NUS called the Center for Future Ready Graduates. And it's worth uh, going on their website and looking at what they're trying to do. They're trying to develop these sets, these sets of skills um, through different interventions throughout the academic uh, experience to help them with this. Because there is this issue of what they call the, the, uh, the bamboo ceiling, that a lot of these kids make it so far in their careers, but not any further, because they don't have those essential soft skills. Um, so I, I look at networking a bit like air miles, you know, you fly around and you build them up and you, you, you build them up, build them up, build them up. Every so often, you know, you cash them in. They become really helpful, really important. And I think that's, that's a little bit of a way of looking at it. And this stage of my career now, having been worked around the world, come back to Ireland, I just want to pass this stuff on. I just want to, because I was fortunate, people really gave me a lot along the way and helped me a lot and i just want to try and do more of this stuff to more people and i'm really keen to get this into universities and colleges to make modules of networking and a critical part of an undergraduate experience and indeed for the mba experience and the postgraduate experience so along the way i had a few light bulb moments uh, about networking and about my career first was that you know life is a game of inches you know, the difference between success and failure, coming first and second, we see it in sport all the time, can be minuscule, can be absolutely tiny. Uh, I used to work, I spent 10 years working for the IDA, the Industrial Development Authority that you'd be familiar with, um, whose job is to get inward investment into Ireland. I was just reading, just reading a report on the back of the Irish Times about six weeks ago, full page article on the story of Intel and why Intel came to Ireland. And I was on the fringes of that way back. And Kieran McGowan was the CEO of IDA Ireland, fantastic guy. And Intel came to Europe and said, we need to select a manufacturing center for Intel in Europe. And it came down to six countries. Then it came down to two countries. And they decided to locate in Scotland. And they said, Scotland's a bigger domestic market in the UK. Scotland's got more academics, more um, electronic engineers coming out of the academic system than Ireland, so we're going to plump for Scotland. And Kieran, in his ultimate genius and wisdom, hired a recruitment company who went out and identified and spoke to 1,000 Irish electronic engineers, none of them working in Ireland, all of them working for the great electronic companies, the Nixdorfs and Motorola's and, you know, Ericsson's and those sorts of companies, Nokia, those sorts of companies. Um, and 80% of them said, you know what, if Intel come to Ireland, we'll come back, we'd love to come back to Ireland or work for Intel. Intel considered that information, changed their decision, decided not to go to Scotland, went to Ireland. The implications for Ireland, absolutely gigantic, enormous. Billions of investment, thousands and thousands of jobs, construction jobs and jobs in Intel down at Leakeswood. 
and the difference the, that between winning and losing that deal was was a hair's breadth. It was a wafer thin, but the implications were absolutely gigantic and enormous. You know, the second thing I learned was that one introduction, one conversation can change your life. Um, an example of that is when I went to the U, went to Australia. I didn't know anybody. Um, my mum gave me a name of a neighbour's kid, and I rang that guy and I said. Uh, can you introduce me to the local Irish Business Network? And he said, well, actually, there isn't one here in Sydney. I said, let's set one up. So we got 13 people and we, we had an event and we called ourselves the Lansdowne Road Club because both of us used to play rugby. We thought, we'll, we'll, we'll use this as a kind of a ruse. And then as this thing grew in a spirit of sporting ecumenism, we decided to drop the road and we just called it the Lansdowne Club. The Lansdowne Club now has got 5,000 members in Sydney. It's one of the biggest Irish business networks in the world. But it started at nothing. I love the notion that nobody started a large organization. You know, Apple Computer started when Steve Jobs, age 21, put together some bits of a computer with a guy called Steve Wozniak in, um, in a garage in Cupertino uh, in California. <laughs> and look where that company is now, Apple Computers. Down the road, you two guys, one called Bill Hewlett, the other called Doug Packard. Hewlett and Packard, around the corner. Walt Disney, in a shed, created his first cartoon. Um, more recently, you know, Zuckerberg in a dorm in Harvard started Facebook. You know, Amazon and Starbucks started in people's front rooms. Here in Ireland, you know, just look where the Stripe Boys out of Limerick, where they've gone from a village in Limerick to where they are now. Uh, in 1985, a plane took off from Waterford with 15 passengers. The plane was called Ryanair. Look what that's achieved. So it's always extraordinary when you think of the, where people have come from. That's not just in the for-profit space, it's also in the non-profit space. You know, um, Pieta House, where we all were walking just a few weeks ago, the darkness into light, but oh, 250,000 people walked around the world for that. It started with just a few people going for a walk on a beach. Um, Men's Sheds, which is, um, an organization for men to do uh, furniture and build boats and all that kind of stuff, started with one men's shed, came from Australia actually, and now there's 450 throughout Ireland. The organization I worked for um, was, the, was the Ireland Funds. I worked for them in the EU. I worked in total 21 years for them. Our first event was held in the Waldorf Astoria in New York. Um, the objective was could we develop a network of people who would have an interest in supporting opportunities in the area of peace, culture, charity in Ireland, particularly issues in Northern Ireland. We didn't know if it was, if it was a valid proposition. We had this great event. The dinner was so unsuccessful. The only reason we had a second dinner a year later was to pay for the first dinner. And that's $700 million ago. So that was my kind of second lesson. First lesson was, you know, this idea of that life is a game of inches. Second lesson, one introduction, one conversation can change your life. But they don't happen lying in bed or sitting at your desk. They happen in when you're in motion, when you're out and about, when you put your talents on display, when you talk to strangers, when you break your routines. That's when these sorts of things happen. So, so what is networking? Well, basically it's long-term hearts and minds, sustainable relationships. We kind of know all of that. But not everybody gets the second piece about networking. Networking is all about giving, not getting. You see, we all think, I got to network because I need to get a sale. I, I need to find a job, so I'm going to network. It's about me, 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 me. But actually, if you turn that around and say, no, I'm going to think, what can I give to my network? How can I put my network at the disposal of other people? How can I add value? to other people's lives through my network. And if you do that on a consistent basis, helping individuals, guess what? It comes back to you from the network. And essentially, you know, the network's about three things. It's about um, changing your mindset from being transaction driven to being relationship driven. Easy for me to say that because, but yet lots of people depend on transactions and sales. And I hear my saying, just think about the relationship. So that's an interesting challenge. It's about uh, moving um, your, it's about moving your, so the way you think about things, uh, but moving the, I, the whole idea of it all being about getting a sale or getting some opportunity. It's about altering your behavior. 
Now, behavior change is about the hardest thing in the world. And we all know it when we're going to do diets and get into exercise. I mean, it's hard to break behavior. So it is doing that behavior change. And it's about a certain number of really sort of specific skills. But when you think about your network, you do have to ask yourself what I call three kind of brutal questions. First question is, is my network good enough for where I want to be in the next few years? So we see, we look at that question. Secondly, what do I need to do now, kind of, you know, to get ready for the next phase? And thirdly, you know, I have a network, but but is it the right one? So the objectives of what we're trying to do this morning, and what I do in a more general sense uh, with companies and organisations, is to to convince people, try to convince people that this stuff is important for your personal and business lives. You have to put it front and centre. Um, that there's a process to networking and if you follow the process you have a greater chance of success than if you don't. You only have to be a little bit better than other people for that point I made earlier about life is a game of inches and also most people won't make the effort so if you make the effort you know you're going to be ahead and your relationships are kind of like muscles you know if you don't exercise them they atrophy they they die and you do have to have a, a networking plan you know if you don't have a plan you know if you don't take action quick as a flash, nothing happens. And you know, we all have finance plans and we have HR plans and we, have, you know, all sorts of different plans, but we need to have a, a networking plan. And you know, you need to be smart in this world. We all know and people coming out of your institutions are all very smart, etc. but you need to be savvy. And savvy is about having cop on. It's about understanding, you know, the unwritten rules of life. I think that that's becomes a very important thing. So, the elephant in the room, of course, right now is pandemic, you know, virus raging out of control, devastating economies, millions have died. It is a shocking, awful uh, occasion. And the year is 1918 and it's the Spanish flu. And 500 million people were infected by the Spanish flu. 50 million people died. In Ireland, 800,000 people caught the virus and 23,000 people died. It was a terrible, terrible time. And yet, and yet, this awful Spanish flu was followed by an incredible period of innovation, creativity, and growth, driven by two things, driven by technology and driven by pent-up capital. You know, back then, we had the uh, production of millions of motor cars, which resulted in creating highways and hotels and restaurants and sports stadia. We had the emergence of the radio to inform the world. We had movies to entertain the masses. It was an incredible, incredible period that led on to the Roaring Twenties. So what if a hundred years later, we go through something similar, driven by the same things, you know, technology, because success back then went to the individuals and companies that embraced technology. So what if, it's technology again, with 5G global rollout of the broadband, a massive investment in the green economy. And of course, we do have the other ingredient, which is, you know, pent up capital. So, you know, what can we do and what can we have to do in the last period when we can't network? You know, I, I've always had a difficulty with a couple of some of the vocabulary we've been using lately. We talk a lot about remote working. I don't really like that term because it makes you feel quite lonely and isolated. I think it should be called digital working. I think that's a much more positive expression. Also, we talk a lot about social distancing. You know, I, it should really be physical distancing and we should be social connecting. So what we're doing today and what Gavin and Trevor have put together with Kate's help is this extraordinary confection this morning, which we never would have thought about in the years past. And even though I have to say, personally, I'm struggling uh, with this whole pandemic, I'm missing the stuff that I'm so familiar doing, and I, I find every day seems the same, and I can't wait to shake it all off and get back in action. Even though those are negative ideas I have about it all, I also can see some positives about what we've all gone through in the last period. Firstly, we're not restricted geographically. I've actually, this is my 82nd webinar that I've done since COVID-19 arrived in 15 different countries. It's absolutely been fantastic for me. In fact, you know, my friends call me a, a baby Zoomer and, and one rather nastily, 
calls me a Zimmer Zoomer, but but it has been amazing. You're you're not restricted geographically. Um, we don't have to waste money on t time and energy and carbon footprint and um, and grooming time and all those different things. That's absolutely fantastic. People are available. Everybody's available. I keep getting people calling me up saying, are you around next week? Of course I'm around next week. I can't go anywhere. So everybody's available and more people are spending more time online than ever before in history. And because of one company, LinkedIn, where 750 million people have told this company, here's my education details, here's my qualifications, here's my experience, my work experience. You can have it and you can have it for free. Wow, I mean, I've always found free a very compelling price point in my business. So that's, that's amazing. So it's quite extraordinary what's happened. So now we have the opportunity to create an entirely new online tribe. That's what we've done. And we've looked at things like social media, and particularly we, we use in the networking institute, we use LinkedIn. And we, we, we aim to use it to, to serve, not sell, not be using it as a selling device, but use it as a way of giving stuff away, of this sort of active beneficence that we feel will come back to us, and it has. Um, we think it's, uh, as the old cliche is, now is the time to shine online, if you like. So that was totally changed our business. So when we go back, no, we won't go back. When we go on, to whatever is the new way of working, living, learning, traveling, holidaying, whatever that new way is, we're going to have a whole new tribe of supporters of people in suit, and we're also going to have our old traditional one because we've made a strong effort to keep in, in connection with these people. But we are in for a world of a time of disruption, in for a time of um, extraordinary turbulence, but also, I think, some interesting opportunity. And it's wrong to think that, uh, you know, before COVID arrived, that we weren't in an extraordinary period of flux and change. It was a period that was called VUCA or VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. There was an extraordinary amount of AI and robotics and automation were devastating whole sectors and whole industries. So change was in the air. I remember hearing the CEO of Mercedes-Benz saying, you know, change is happening now faster than ever before and never will be as slow again. Um, and so dramatic things were happening. Now they've all been kind of accelerated, but just think in terms of the following sentence. If I said to you, if I said to you, uh, uh, if I said to you just 10 years ago, um, I'm in my Uber on my iPhone, booking an Airbnb in Limerick, the only word anybody would have understood in that sentence would have been the word limerick because those three other things 10 11 years ago didn't exist but now the question is what are the things 10 years from now in all of our lifetimes hopefully um that would be kind common parlance and we've never even heard of them now and that's that kind of dramatic change that we're in for this notion i think is that success in the past is no guarantee of success in the future the strategies that got us here won't get us there. As Peter Drucker, the American management consultant, said, to create the future, you have to be the enemy of today. Or Charles Darwin, the great British anthropologist, who said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's not even the most intelligent. It's those most able to handle change. And then I was just uh, read this report. I'll just show it to you here on, online. I read this report last week, which was a McKinsey report, the future of work after COVID-19. Kind of interesting because one of the things they say in this report they said that between now and the year 2030 in eight major economies in the world a hundred million people are going to have to switch occupation so yes there will be incredible churn the companies are going to reconfigure their whole structures individuals are going to have to reconsider their career options so why then, you know, is networking so important in all of this flux and change? Well, frankly, you can't go it alone. You know, you can't be successful uh, without uh, being involved with other people. There is this kind of myth of individualism that sometimes gets peddled. The kind of the Marlboro man, the Lone Ranger, you know, it's the rugged individual against the world, taking it all on and winning. It's all bullshit. Life is about connecting, collaborating, cooperating with other people. Opportunities don't float around on clouds. They're attached to people. So if you're looking for an opportunity, you're really looking for a person. 
And we all know the good things about networking and the helpful things in terms of our businesses and helpful to get sales and helpful to find staff and attract investors, all that good stuff. But the reason I'm interested in it is that all the research shows that people who have strong and diverse networks, the diverse piece is important, live longer, are stronger mentally and physically, earn more money and are happier. I kind of like all of those. I also think networking is the antidote to one of the great crises of our time, which is loneliness. And if you think about it, you know, when you link, somebody asked me the other day, they said, when you look back on your career, what were the most enjoyable th times of your life and the best memories? Were they spent in front of a screen or were they spent with other people? You know, the answer for me was, was obvious. But your network is the way you're gonna get your next job. 80% of good jobs are not advertised. And you all know that in your career advisory roles, etc. is that how important your networking is for your career in that sense. Your network is the way you're going to escape your silo. I mean, at work, we're so siloed, we're so work, we're so head down, we're busy being busy. So we need a way to find out what's going on at a broader place. And that's going to be through your network. And then there's this interesting concept of homophily. Homophily is a kind of a fancy Greek word meaning the, the tendency we have to hang around with people just like us, the sort of birds of a feather flock together concept. And that's dangerous because it doesn't reflect the world we live in. Just consider these statistics. 14% of the United States were not born in the United States. In Ireland, it's 17%. In Dublin, it's 25%. Of the working age population of Dublin, it's 33%. So we live in an incredibly diverse society. But the question is, does your network as an individual and the organization you work for reflect the diversity of the economy you operate in, the company or the organization you work for? And the answer generally is no. So, you know, all the research says you as a company, you as an individual underperform. So that is an interesting challenge that we all kind of have to face. So, you know, my dad left school at 14, joined a company, and left that company age 77. Just a quick 63 years in one company. Well, those days have gone. You know, that whole job structure, the whole, we used to call the, the escalator model of a career, where you join, get promoted, work, get promoted, work. That's gone. Millennials are moving faster and more often than ever before. People see companies as career docking stations where they spend time they want to learn. They want to know what the company is going to do for them to help them progress in their career. You know, so the old days of this kind of vertical world of hierarchies, you know, with a corner office at the top and you spend it, you spend all your life getting there has been replaced by a more horizontal world of teams of teams. And so obviously things like your soft skills and networking becomes important. Um, your network's portable. It's yours. You built it. You own it. When you go, it goes with you. And here's what's interesting. Companies want to hire and wire. Companies want to hire people and wire into their network. So now when you're being interviewed for a job, they want to know about your qualifications. They want to know about your experience. They want to know all of that stuff, but they want to know something else. They want to know who you know, because we live in a world where it's not what you know. It's not even who you know, it's who knows you. But you won't build a strong and diverse network, which is critically important. Unless you get comfortable doing something that we all struggle with, I, me included, talking to strangers. And, you know, when you think about it, what is it we teach our kids from a very young age? We say, don't talk to strangers. And yet, statistically, our kids are at more danger from friends and family than they are from strangers. And when you think about it also, you know, everybody you, you love in life outside your mom and pop and your brothers and sisters, you know, at one stage was... A stranger, something happened that you connected with somebody or you met somebody or you, and, and they became a bosom buddy, maybe a partner for life or a part of your friendship network. And that's the way it is. So all of that is the importance then of talking to strangers, doing something that we are a little uncomfortable with. You know, the second greatest fear in life, according to a book recently, is walking into a room where you know nobody. And incidentally, the number one fear in life, you probably all know this, was actually public speaking. So careers are different now and people have to realize that the technical skills they needed to get their job in the first instance, as important as they are, become less important as they progress through their career.
and relationships become more important. So all the studies show that having the, your network career, the network depends so much on having an open network rather than a closed network. So there are all the kind of interesting things. I was lucky enough to have lived and worked in these different countries. And I realized that people who are good at networking have certain characteristics in common. They work hard at it. They're, they're humble. Uh, they don't brag. They don't keep score. They don't say, hey, Trevor, I did you a favor uh, a few months ago. You owe me one, pal. They kind of don't sort of think like that. They think like farmers who plants a seed, waters, nurtures, and just knows that there's going to be a harvest. They know that their network is a living, breathing thing. If you don't water, nurture, look after it, it will wither and it will die. They understand as companies that there's more smart people outside their company than inside their company. So building a network and network intelligence, as we talked about earlier, is important. Great networkers are curious. They ask questions. They ask great questions. They know that there's two types of information in the world. There's formal information, and you can Google it, and you can read reports, etc. But formal information is available to everybody, and there's informal information. Nudges, tips, winks, suggestions, ideas, gossip. That all comes from your network. They also understand, great networkers, that your weak connections can often be more important than your strong connections because not only which are strong connections not only do you know these people really well you know what they think you know their opinions and views you know who they know and their opinions and views whereas your weak connections will will kind of bridge you into all sorts of different groups and different types of people and that becomes important and great networkers they understand how important technology is they really get it you know they use technology and they're high tech and they're high touch and they get that balance right and we're living in a world where we're migrating so much towards tech that it's an imbalanced kind of situation and great networkers hang out on the rim on the edge of their network that's where they find sort of interesting people and they work on being very visible but i have to say in all frankness there's real problems with networking First of all, most people hate it. I mean, the whole concept of it, the image of networking is sleazy, slimy individuals late at night flicking out business cards at a ferocious rate in a pub in Belfast. You know, you wake up in the morning, you find Trevor Johnson's business card and they turn up your trousers. How did that happen? So, you know, it is, it has got that kind of image, uh, which is unfortunate. Interestingly enough, the word, the noun network, you know, you talk about having a good network, that sounds pretty good and pretty positive. But the verb, networking, boy, that sounds sort of insincere, inauthentic, and dare I say it, a little bit sort of dirty. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's not taught at school or college. Um, companies don't have strategies for it. It's not a KPI. It doesn't show up in the, in the recruitment process. And um, we tend to mix up networking and sociability. We tend to think that the most sociable person is by definition the best networker. And here's what's interesting. Introverts can be better at networking than extroverts. And why is that? Because they do it with decency and authenticity and integrity. They ask questions and they listen. Whereas the extroverts wants to wow you, who wants to spread their kind of social capital thinly over loads of people. And it's all about me, 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 and trying to impress you, etc. So, you know, another problem is networking is important, but you know, it's not urgent. And every, you know, we live our lives doing kind of urgent things. Now, there is a process to networking, and I, I make this a big part of the, I usually do a three-hour workshop on networking, so I'm trying to concertina kind of stuff this morning. But there's a number of elements to this which are worth touching on this morning. Firstly, to answer that brutal question, is my network good enough for where I want to be? You actually have to audit your network. You actually have to print it off and look at it. And when you do that, you discover three things. Firstly, you can clean up your network. There's some redundant entries in there. You know, you get rid of them. You don't need, in my case, a dry cleaners in Boston or a takeaway Chinese food in Sydney. I don't need that. You can clean up your network. You'd also discover you got some gaps in your network. You know nobody in certain areas, and you need to spend time and effort fill, filling those gaps. You don't know anybody in aircraft leasing or tourism or whatever the sector is. And then the third thing you'll discover is you'll discover you had some uh, dormant entries in there. You've got some great connections from the past and you know what you, you've let them slip nothing happened you know just life got in the way you went this way they went that way didn't have a row but you've lost touch so under covid i've been ringing every week one person that i used to know really well from my past 
So I've had over 50 discussions with people, been fabulous, reconnecting with people, reconnected where I left off. Not only have hopefully I moved on so, and up, so they have moved on and up. It's been fascinating. It's been one of the benefits to me of COVID was this notion of reconnecting with redundant or dormant, not redundant, dormant entries. But also you have to segment your, your network because not everybody in your network is the same. And I, I recommend taking a kind of a pyramid approach. And at the bottom of the pyramid is a contact. It's a name on your network. And for the life of you, you can't remember who they were. You must have met them somewhere at a conference, on a flight, at a game. Um, and you swept cards, you put them on your network. But that's pretty weak. It's very weak. But then moving up the pyramid, you have a connection. A connection, you know them, they know you. You're not doing anything. But there's an element of familiarity. If they called you, you'd know who they were and vice versa. Uh, so that's pretty good. Um, then moving up again, you have a relationship. This is great. You know each other. You're doing some business together with each other. You like each other. You trust each other. And we live in a world where trust is at its lowest level in recorded history. The annual Edelman Trust Survey says that trust in four institutions, government, media, nonprofit, and business is at its lowest level in recorded history. So if you build that reputation, you've got that, that's, that's really great stuff. That really has the potential of building and building over a lifetime of engagement with somebody in that relationship. And then at the very top of the pyramid, I call it a friend. And I, I have friends who are friends and I have people I work with are friends, but I don't have many in this category. Uh, because I define it as somebody I could call on their cell phone on a Sunday afternoon. And I wouldn't do that to many people. I really. It's really kind of the list of people you turn to when you're a bit of a family crisis or a bit of a personal crisis. So now yeah, that gives you a little bit of shape to your network and you know where you have to take some action. The second phase, and that's all that research phase of, of your network. And the second phase is cultivation, taking people on a journey of ignorance of you and your organization to a position of passionate zealotry. And the next step is that notion of solicitation. There is a moment when you can ask people for something so many of us assume that everybody knows what we want and you know asking is your most powerful personal marketing tool and yet we all shy away and are nervous of asking and then the fourth phase is stewardship and stewardship is this notion that you know um the number one reason why people give up doing business with another organization is that they detect a spirit of indifference to them we tend to take people for granted and their business for granted. So stewardship is all about that kind of thank you, that reward and recognition of people who are longevity of support or the amount of support, all sorts of different and creative ways, basically, of saying thank you. Because then if you, if people commit to you, they commit to you in a life cycle of giving if you really treat them well. Now, I'm a fan of a guy called uh, Harvey Coleman. Harvey Coleman had a really interesting theory about career progress. It's called the pie theory of career progress. I think for you in the, in the world of advising and helping with careers and helping uh, with getting people positions and jobs, this is a fascinating concept. Um, the pie theory, P stands for performance. He says something outrageous. He says, how well you do your job contributes 10% to your career progress. What? Surely how well you do your job is what it's all about. It's got to be 80, 90%. He says, no. He said, doing a good job is mandatory. It's the minimum. It gets you on the pitch. He said, it gets you on the career ladder. It doesn't get you up the career ladder. For the, he said, you get paid on performance. You get promoted on what other people think of your potential. So it's the I and the E of the pie theory that matter. So the I is image. He said, that's 30% of your career progress. What do people think of you? You know, what are you known for? What do you like as an individual? You know, um, uh, what do people think of you? What's your boss uh, think of you? What's your boss's boss think of you? Do you bring problems or do you bring solutions? When people look at you, could they see you at kind of another level in the organization? So the image is important. And then the E of the pie theory is exposure. And exposure is 60%. So 60% of career progress depends on exposure. And what's that? It's about you know, who's seen you in action, who knows you and, and what you do, you know, who's seen you perform at meetings, who's seen you speak. Do you have strong vocal executive presence? What are you known for uh, inside the organization? What are you known for outside of the organization? What would you be a go-to person for? You know, do you just do visible work or do you do invisible work? You know, what, um, you know, do you have a life bigger than your job? All of that kind of stuff, which is so fascinating. 
And this whole theory, which I rolled out to executives all over the world, and all of them, to a man and a woman, basically say, you know, this is about right. But it turns on its head the piece of advice that I got when I was starting off from my parents in my first career, which was a traditional piece of advice. Work hard, keep your head down, and keep out of trouble. Really pretty shitty advice when I think back on it. And so, you know, this is, I just find this absolutely fascinating, this whole notion. Because a lot of people say, you know what? I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to do a super job. And I'm going to let my work speak for itself. And here's the problem. Work doesn't speak. Other people speak. So now you got those pesky two little words, other people. And if you ever want to watch a YouTube video or a TED Talk of somebody who personifies this approach, then watch Carla Harris, C-A-R-L-A Harris. She was an um, African-American on Wall Street, 35 years, vice chairman of Morgan Stanley, one of the absolute giants of the industry. Um, and she's fantastic. And she says an interesting thing. In your network, in your career, you need three types of people. You need an advisor who will help you technically with your job. You will need to have a mentor who will give you the good, the bad, and the ugly, will help you and you know, give you advice. Could be within your organization, might be outside your organization. But she said you need a third type of person in your network, in your career, in your job. You need a sponsor. The network talks to you. A sponsor talks about you. And why is this really important? Well, she said, because every major decision about your career, about your next promotion, about your compensation, would be made by a group of people sitting around a table in a room, and you won't be in that room. How true is that? And if somebody doesn't know you, has no relationship with you, they're not going to speak up for you. She said, everybody in that room has power, but nobody is going to speak up for somebody they don't know. So you need to have these networks in your relationship. So I'm conscious of time here, and I do want to obey by the rules and regulations, so I, I don't have time to go through the rest of the presentation. But I would say this. In every meeting with every person, always try to remember three great questions. And the first question is, what can I do for you? Not the other way around. The second question is, if you were me, what would you do? And you're paying respect and deference to wisdom and experience. You're asking a question. You're asking for advice. People love giving advice. And you're listening. The number one skill in networking is to be a world-class listener. And both these questions segue into the third question, which is the gold dust question about networking, which is, who do you know who works in aircraft leasing, lives in Brisbane, works in tourism. So what you're really saying is, are you willing to put your reputation on the line and to make an introduction for me? And that's like having a passport at a border. That changes everything when somebody is willing to trust you enough to introduce you to somebody in their network. So if I were to sum up what I'm trying to say over the last 45 minutes, is that what we're trying to do here is to replace cold calls with hot coffees. That's what networking is all about. So my time is up. I would love if people would connect with me on LinkedIn. I give away stuff for free, and I'm happy to do that if you connect with me. But Trevor, I want to abide by the rules of this wonderful organization and stop there now. Thank you so much, Kingsley. That was inspiring and challenging in equal measure. So um, I was frantically taking um, notes there, but we, we have also recorded it. So you've got us off to such a strong start. So first of all, on behalf of the AHEX board and uh, all of our delegates, thank you so much for that. Uh, right. We have a few questions here in the Q&A. Um, so I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going to put a couple of questions. We have sort of 15 minutes here. So uh, the first question is coming from Orla here. And Orla is asking, do you have any tips on how to advise students to network in a virtual environment? In a virtual environment? You know, um, look, I think they, I think it's important that people think in terms of their own personal branding. And I always am a little nervous about that expression, personal branding, because um, it makes you sound like a tin of beans. But the reality is, 
we all have we all have personal brands, whether we like it or not. In fact, not having a personal brand is having a personal brand. And I think we need now to have a brand online. You know, this line I said, now is the time to shine online. Um, if you Google Trevor Johnson, if you put Trevor Johnson into Google, the number one thing that comes up is your LinkedIn profile. So for starters, everybody should have a LinkedIn profile. Um, and the LinkedIn profile shouldn't be about you. It should be about what you do that might be of interest and of use to other people. Uh, so many people put up on their LinkedIn profile a whole load of glorious achievements in life, but they're of no relevance So um, to somebody who's scrolling through. So I think as a de minimis, I'd say, get, to get them down the road is to develop an online profile on LinkedIn. And then they become active if they want to, but at least then people will will, will be able to check you out. And that's, that's what people do now. They go online to check out people and to find areas of commonality, whether it be through school, sports, interests, hobbies, whatever it is. And that begins to break the ice. Thank you for that, Kingsley. Um, another question here then from uh, Paula, um, just asking about the generations. So given that Gen Z, Gen Alpha generations seem to spend so much more time on social media, uh, do you think it's easier or more difficult for them to form a diverse network than the older generation? Can I put myself in the older generations ca category? I think it is, and I think the downside of social media is that it's resulted in people talking and not speaking, talking electronically but not speaking interpersonally. I mean, I, I, I was with the head of Accenture a while ago, and he said the big problem we have is to get people to speak to each other. They will send a text message, they will send an email, but they won't pick up the phone. The telephone is the single most powerful marketing tool that you have. It's actually better in a way than Zooming, et cetera, because there's too many distractions with Zoom. The telephone, you're just listening to what somebody says. That's all kind of nearly Dickensian, what I'm saying to, to these people. But I do think that we have that struggle um, in terms of getting people to move from talking to speaking. Thank you, M. Kingsley. So. Uh, Mark asks, I mean, you touched on this in, in your opening remarks around, you know, different countries you've worked in. Uh, what best practice have you come across for building a relevant network quickly? Like Mark's talking in less than a year from scratch when you move to a new country. Sure. So, you know, I think you have to be selective. You have to choose segments and it could be a professional segment. So if you're an accountant, then you, you get involved with the local accountancy body. But 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 you attend events. I mean, you just get to see people. You shake hands, you spend time with people. I mean, that's been starched out of our lives over the last uh, 15 months. And I think we're all desperately missing it. And that's why I, I, I'm very conscious of this, this kind of retraction and reduction of, of people's networks, particularly their weak connections. So I think that it's a combination of things. Sometimes people say to me, you know, I hate network, I hate everybody, everything about it. I'm not going to do it. What do you advise? So I say, well, you know, coach your kid's soccer team, go to a book club, go to church or whatever it is. And guess what you end up doing? You end up networking. I knew when, when the Ireland funds, when we set up the Ireland funds, we had a very large board, about 90 people around the, all of the United States. And I began to realize that people were engaged with us, not just because they loved Ireland, but actually for self-interested reasons, they were on a board where they could sit beside somebody who was running a, you know, a consumer products company, running an advertising agency, running a real estate agency. So we were offering this service of giving these people an opportunity to meet a broad and diverse network of people. And it, it became a very powerful ecosystem. There's a, if I just a moment, there was a wonderful story of a woman called Mary Gates who was on the board of United Way in the United States. And at one of the board meetings, she was sitting beside the head of IBM who said, what are your kids doing? And Mary said, well, one of them has dropped out of Harvard. Is, you know, he's got some bloody system with computers and, and he's had 50 meetings with companies and nobody's taken it on. So um, the head of IBM told Mary Gates to send her son, Bill Gates, in to meet with him. And the rest, as I say, is history. IBM took on MS-DOS. That's how it started. Yeah, amazing. The richest man in the world now. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Kingsley. Um, there's a couple of questions here on uh, building diverse networks. So we'll, I'll bring them together. Do you have uh, thoughts on how to uh, maintain and develop links uh, between uh, groups where your network might be um, quite, you know, a privileged network? I think you used the term homo homophily, was it? Homophily. Where the birds, of, the birds of a feather flock together. So uh, can you say a bit more just on building diverse networks? There's a couple of questions here in that. Uh, how do you uh, do the diverse or make sure that it's that your networks are diverse? 
So I think you have to be proactive rather than reactive. And I think you have to look for unlike-minded people. In other words, go to places and seek out people who are different from you. Um, so I, I, and I took some action about five, six, seven years ago. Um, I, I volunteered to be a mentor to a migrant to Ireland. And um, I wanted um, somebody from Africa. So I now mentor a woman from Nigeria who lives in Dublin. And in fact, it was quite funny. At, the fir at my first meeting with this, this woman, um, she told me about her education and her master's degree. And she told me about the PhD she has in data analytics. I was at that stage, I said, uh, is there any chance you could mentor me? Because you know she was so much brighter, smarter, more educated than me, fantastic woman. And she said, no, you don't understand. She said, I work for PayPal, I work from home. Um, I don't have a network, but you do. So that's where I was able to add some value. I, so I take her to events, like Chamber of Commerce events, et cetera. So I think you need to be a little bit proactive, get outside your comfort zone, seek out people who don't look and sound like you. It's very easy for all of us to migrate back to people who are just like us. And we do that all the time. There's nothing wrong with it at one level, but also it just is, is a bit of a self-defeating thing. So it, it is about going 51% of the way, not 49% of the way. Okay, just a couple more things. We've we've worked you hard here. So uh, Fiona is asking, did you notice any particular difference between how uh, people in the U.S. network to the way we might network in Ireland? Do you see any cultural differences there? I think uh, the Americans are a bit more transactional, a bit more direct. Um, they tell you straight away what they're looking for. Irish people are much more devious, cunning, rusé. You know, they sort of d dance around things. Um, I, I mean, I find Americans, um, you know very competent, very confident. Um, and I noticed with my own kids who went to school there, the eldest up to the age of 12, every day in class, they had to get up and present and talk in front of groups of people. And when they came back here, that wasn't so much a feature of it. So, it, you know, a couple of the, my kids ended up getting very involved in debating. And I think that came out of what they learned in the United States. So I think the United States um, does engender that sense of directness and, and uh, a bit more sort of upfront confidence. And I think that's something that we have to work on hard here. Okay. Um, then uh, students with poor social skills or low confidence base, uh, what advice would you give to them to just get them started? Yeah, so they need help. I mean, they they need, they, you know, you just can't push them into an event or push them to an activity. I think it's important thing that we're aware of issues, p people who have, who have particular issues and and either take the correct kind of professional help if that's needed or you know just keep a guide keep an eye on them make sure that there's somebody with them make sure that they're not left isolated you know and we all hate that moment where we're in, we're in a, a crowded venue and we know not a single person then to go up and barge into a group everybody seems to be talking to people they know so that's you know that's all getting out of your comfort zone and doing that stuff it's not easy and some people need more help than others that's fantastic. Um, last question I would ask you, Kingsley, then, is any books that you would recommend to us in networking, any resources in this space that, that you would draw our attention to? You know, here's a funny thing. I'm going to suggest, you know, the classic was written by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And, you know, I laugh because it's written in a kind of a slightly folksy kind of tone. But it sold, you know, 50 million copies. It's in every airport in the world today. Um, Warren Buffett is the most successful investor in the history of mankind. And he said, my most important investment in my career was to do the Dale Carnegie course. I mean, he went to Wharton. He's got a you know master's, etc. He's only one certificate on the wall of his office in, 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 in Nebraska, and that is his Dale Carnegie certificate. So what did Dale Carnegie say, to save you reading the book, that uh, that was so uh, memorable? And, and, and he said really simple things. He said, a really good question beats a really good comment. How true is that? He said, the smile on your face means more than the clothes on your back. He said, to be interesting, be interested. He said, when you talk about yourself and your interests, people think you're a bore. When you let them talk about themselves and their interests, they think you're a great conversationalist. I mean, he said lots of folksy things, which are actually pretty true today. So I'd read anything by Dale Carnegie. Um, I think Keith Perazzi is an American who's written some good stuff. I think Nancy Klein is a, an American who lives in London. Uh, has written great stuff, a, a book called Time to Think, about um, how you create a thinking environment and how you become a really world-class listener. I think those three books would be great. And then the one I mentioned at the beginning, Social Chemistry by Marissa King, and this thing about you know men's networks having decreased and women's not, that's kind of fascinating, very topical and only just released. 
That's great. I think that's a great place to um, leave at Kingsley. Thank you so much. Thank You've you. been so generous with your, your time and you've been inspiring.